Okay. Um, I've been asked to also introduce myself a little bit for the, uh, the taping, uh, so I'll repeat what our colleague has just said. Uh, I'm Daryl Regeer. I um, uh, have just um, stepped down as the research director of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, where I was from 2000 to uh, 2014, and during that time, uh, developed um, the and directed the development of the um, uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the uh, fifth edition uh, that we're going to be discussing today. Um, prior to that, I was at the uh, National Institute of Mental Health in the U.S. Uh, in IMH uh, for 25 years, uh, serving as uh, director of uh, various divisions of research and epidemiology, of clinical research, and of also the health services and health policy research. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to join you uh, today. And um, the agenda that we have uh, was designed to give uh, some background to the uh, DSM-5, which I understand is now uh, used here. Uh, it's beginning to be uh, used in the uh, training uh, of the um, uh, residents and uh, medical students. Uh, and we'll uh, go over some of the, um, the uh, changes that uh, have taken place uh, in the overall conceptual approach to diagnosis, uh, as well as uh, in uh, some of the specific areas. Uh, professor Adam Basaga is uh, with me, is a professor of psychiatry at the uh, Columbia University and is an expert in addiction psychiatry. Uh, and so we will have some time to um, uh, discuss, uh, uh, perhaps in somewhat more detail, for those of you who are uh, particularly interested in addiction psychiatry, some of the issues there. And in general, we'll try to be somewhat flexible in the uh, presentation so that if there are questions about individual diagnostic areas and the reasons for some of the changes that took place, uh, we'll be happy to um, uh, address those. So I understand that uh, we may have uh, some people joining us uh, as the day goes on, uh, so it'll be uh, difficult to uh, recapitulate everything that uh, I say this morning. So for those of you who are able to stay through the whole thing, you'll have uh, a better sense of the, uh, uh, the background of, of what uh, has happened with the DSM-5. So we uh, certainly want to thank uh, AstraZeneca uh, for their support of this, and um, uh, we hope that uh, the uh, continuing medical education that you uh, receive uh, from this will be um, certainly helpful for your uh, professional uh, practices. Um, so what I'd like to do is start a little bit with the um, kind of the history of uh, classification going back to the beginning of um, kind of the 1900s. Um, and uh, certainly at that time, uh, the first half of the last century uh, was heavily influenced, uh, certainly in Europe, by uh, Kreplin uh, and a very categorical approach to diagnosis. Uh, in the U.S., it was much more of a, and it was a very biological approach that, um, um, that Kreplin took in trying to replicate what uh, Alzheimer had done of finding really a biological, neurological basis for mental disorders. Uh, Kreplin tried to, the same thing with schizophrenia, uh, was uh, not successful, uh, but was helpful in making a distinction between the affective or manic depressive illnesses and the schizophrenia illnesses, validated really only on the basis of uh, clinical history, that um, the cycle and uh, relatively uh, better outcome for affective psychosis compared with what he called dementia precox um, uh, was uh, an important contribution at the turn of the century. However, uh, certainly Sigmund Freud and uh, Adolf Meyer in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, were more interested in the interaction of um, kind of environmental exposures for Adolf Meyer and what life events uh, did to produce uh, mental disorders. And uh, of course, uh, Freud was more interested in kind of a psychosocial and psychosexual developmental approach, uh, and kind of an intrapsychic approach uh, to understanding mental disorders. Um, a major event occurred with the uh, establishment of the United Nations uh, in 1946. 
uh, in which they took responsibility for the international classification of diseases. Um, and so uh, the U.S. and uh, Great Britain and the various Western countries worked very closely with the WHO through uh, the 1955 revision of ICD, which was ICD-7. Uh, 1965 was ICD-8 and uh, ICD-9 was in 1977. Um, when the WHO took this over, in uh, about 1960, there was a British psychiatrist by the name of Irvin Stengel uh, who reviewed all of the schools of psychiatry in the world, uh, wrote a very nice little monograph for the WHO about the differences between all these schools, and thought that this was so chaotic that the only way that the field could, could progress is if there were very clear descriptive criteria of individual disorders regardless of etiology and that that would allow better communication between clinicians and researchers uh, to advance the field until we really understood etiology or the causes of disorders. Um, however, uh, he was basically ignored because of the power, of the, the political power of all the nations uh, in uh, the WHO. Uh, and so the, the 1965 uh, edition, the ICD-8, did not follow his recommendations. It had just kind of brief names for disorders and, and also codes that were used for international statistics. Um, and in 19, but what they did add is they added a, a glossary of some definitions. And then in 19, uh, from 1967 uh, to 72, um, and I think I have a pointer here. Pointer doesn't work. Um, that's okay, I can, I know there's one here. Okay, so from um, 1967 to 1972, uh, there was a very important uh, study that took place uh, with uh, Great Britain and U.S. in New York City, in London and in New York. And this became known as the U.S.-U.K. study. And the, what developed this is that um, a statistician at the National Institute of Mental Health recognized that rates of of admission in London for schizophrenia were uh, much lower uh, than there were rates of diagnosis for affective or manic depressive illness. Whereas in New York was exactly the, the opposite. Much higher rates of schizophrenia and lower rates of manic depressive or affective psychoses. And the concern was, uh, is there something different uh, in the water supply or uh, in, in in genetics or in these two countries that would account for this. And so what they undertook was this uh, research study uh, to have, this, have uh, a team define what the criteria would be for schizophrenia and manic depressive illness and they developed a standard interview. Uh, and when they used the standard interview and the same approach, they found that the rates were virtually identical uh, of schizophrenia and manic depressive illness. Well, this kind of replicated then the recommendation of, um, of uh, Stengel to say that if we're going to advance, we have to use the same terminology, the same descriptions of disorders, uh, even if we don't know what the causes of these disorders are. And at about the same time in the U.S., uh, the St. Louis uh, uh, Washington University uh, was developing some very explicit diagnostic criteria that they called the finer criteria. Um, and this was named after uh, one of the chief residents uh, at uh, Washington University St. Louis who actually helped to organize a regular uh, seminar series to try to develop explicit diagnostic descriptive criteria. Uh, so, um, and these were published in 1972 for uh, 16 different disorders. Now about the same time, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health decided that they wanted to do a longitudinal study of uh, depressive illness to try to understand more about the biological and psychological uh, um, uh, causes for these disorders. 
And so uh, they asked uh, Robert Spitzer, who had worked with the US-UK study and the people at uh, Washington University St. Louis, to come up with a set of diagnostic criteria for major depression and schizophrenia and, and a few other disorders. And Bob Spitzer helped to develop the research diagnostic criteria uh, that came out uh, after that. Um, so uh, in 1978, he modified and expanded these uh, finer criteria and the um, uh, research diagnostic criteria, RDC, and the schizophrenia and affective disorder schedule interview were developed uh, by Spitzer to help uh, standardize approaches to psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, Spitzer was also named then to be the chair of the uh, DSM-3 task force uh, in 1974, and he, he worked on the basis of this work, developed the DSM-3, which was published in 1980, which was the first um, uh, classification to actually uh, use the approach that uh, Irvin Stengel had recommended 20 years earlier to have really explicit diagnostic criteria for mental disorders. Um, and uh, this went beyond the glossary of symptoms that was uh, uh, present in then the ICD-9, uh, and there was a split then between the ICD-9 and the DSM-3, whereas before they had always been very closely allied. Um, then in 1979, just before uh, the um, uh, DSM-3 was um, released, um, I was responsible for the epidemiology research programs at the uh, APA, and um, we had agreement because of uh, President Carter's uh, national kind of uh, commission on mental health uh, to actually initiate a whole new set of epidemiologic studies based on the DSM-3 that was just coming out. And um, uh, Lee Robbins uh, uh, from Washington University St. Louis developed then the diagnostic interview schedule to incorporate DSM-3 criteria and we then undertook the epidemiologic catchment area study uh, in the U.S. of some 20,000 uh, community and institutionalized residents to see how these criteria would actually work in a large epidemiologic study. Um, in addition, Spitzer developed um, uh, the uh, clinical interview, uh, the schedule for clinic, uh, the um, uh, schedule for clinical interview in D for DSM um, that um, was used for clinical purposes, and the DIS then uh, actually was um, uh, used later to develop the CD interview, the Composite International Diagnostic Interview that uh, has been used by Ron Kessler for the World Mental Health Surveys. Um, so, um, very importantly, after the DSM was uh, completed, in 1982, there was a major international conference at, um, in Copenhagen uh, in which um, really it was uh, something like 47 countries uh, had representatives um, uh, with 150 participants, and this resulted in a joint uh, WHO, Alcohol, Drug Abuse, Mental Health Administration, and American Psychiatric Association effort to develop the DSM-4 and the ICD-10 uh, to make it more compatible so that the ICD would catch up with the same approach that the DSM-3 uh, had taken to have these explicit diagnostic criteria. Uh, in the process of that, uh, we then uh, kind of donated the, um, uh, whoops, excuse me, hit the wrong button here. Um, so we donated the, um, uh, the, the um, DIS interview to become the Composite International Diagnostic Interview uh, for uh, the WHO, and they also developed the SCAN, the Schedules for Clinical Assessment and Neuropsychiatry and the International Personality Disorders Examination uh, to um, uh, be available for international use. So a brief summary for the DSM is this. Uh, in 1952, there was the uh, DSM-1, and this was based on Adolf Meyer's approach of kind of uh, reactions to different um, 
uh, environmental stimuli that, that could cause depression or schizophrenia and the like. DSM-2 added glossary definitions similar to in 1968. DSM-3 in 1980 had this emphasis on explicit diagnostic criteria focusing on the reliability of diagnoses. 1987, there was the DSM-3R that um, uh, actually took advantage of the results from the epidemiologic catchment area study and showed that if you had the kind of hierarchy that was present then in both the ICD and in the DSM-3 that if you had a higher order like dementia uh, diagnosis you couldn't have schizophrenia and if you have schizophrenia you couldn't have an affective disorder like major depression and if you had that uh, major depression, you couldn't have an anxiety disorder. So everything was kind of in a hierarchy. Uh, what the epidemiologic research showed that if you use that kind of hierarchy, you would suppress an enormous amount of information and you would not understand um, you know, the complexity of the disorders that you were actually supposed to be treating. So uh, the hierarchies were largely removed in DSM uh, 3R, uh, and then in DSM-4 uh, that came out in uh, 1992, uh, they were concerned that too many people were being diagnosed that really didn't have any impairment or disability, and they added a clinical significance uh, distress or impairment uh, criteria to all diagnoses in DSM-4. And DSM-5, when we started this, we wanted to have some, um, some changes that would represent really new knowledge that had occurred in the areas of neuroscience, uh, genetics, um, uh, certainly in some of the psychological therapies and the like about um, how these disorders responded to treatment and um, the fact that uh, there were not the kind of strict boundaries between disorders that had been uh, thought uh, possible uh, with a more Kreplinian approach and I'll be discussing a little bit about how uh, we, we went about this. So as I mentioned, the DSM-3R uh, um, was responsible for uh, trying to reduce some of the hierarchical arrangement of uh, the um, previous DSM-3. Uh, DSM-4 um, still had a six, strict separation between disorders and in DSM-5, uh, our concern was could we uh, deal with the fact that, uh, that most patients who came in didn't just have one disorder. They often had multiple disorders. And uh, how could we account for these high rates of comorbidity if uh, to have uh, the earlier thinking was if you had a valid diagnosis, all the symptoms that were responsible for that uh, diagnosis should be very distinct from another diagnosis. And that just simply is not the way nature is. It's not the way, and the patients didn't read the DSM-5 before they came in for care and they didn't follow, they didn't really fit uh, perfectly into the category. So we were trying to uh, account for this and we, we found that this not otherwise specified uh, category which didn't uh, fit each individual diagnosis, where patients didn't fit the diagnoses perfectly, they would be often diagnosed with NOS uh, in kind of a general category of a depression, but, but not a specific one. Uh, there was also treatment nonspecificity. So the idea that separate disorders would have completely separate treatments just did not pan out. So antidepressants are used not just for depression, but they're used for anxiety disorders, they're used for eating disorders, they're, uh, they're used for you know, a range of, um, of disorders. And likewise, although initially the Kreplinian distinction between manic depressive illness or bipolar disorder and schizophrenia meant that lithium was helpful for say manic depressive and, and Thorazine uh, was helpful or chlorpromazine was, and the neuroleptics were good for schizophrenia. With the atypical antipsychotics, they became the mood stabilizers for, um, for the um, affective psychoses and they became the um, antipsychotic drugs for the schizophrenia psych psychosis. So all of these things uh, you know, led us to, to think that 
we need to rethink our diagnoses if uh, we're going to pay attention to some of the differences um, in, uh, in how these disorders actually respond to treatment and how they uh, relate to uh, some of the new genetics research and other areas of research that were starting to emerge. So we wanted to try to improve the validity of the diagnoses, move toward a more etiologically based classification, look at some of the cognitive or behavioral sciences, the family studies, molecular genetics, neurosciences, imaging studies, and see if we could improve our diagnostic uh, criteria. And we thought this would really require a paradigm shift from kind of a strict categorical uh, Kreplinian approach to more of a uh, spectrum and a gene environmental interaction approach uh, as opposed to um, uh, the, the somewhat simplistic approach that all these disorders should be completely separate. Uh, we started with an initial uh, work group that um, uh, worked together with the World Psychiatric Association, the uh, American Psychiatric Association, the National Institutes of Health, um, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, and produced an initial uh, set of six white papers uh, on everything from neuroscience to culture. We then commissioned three additional white papers on infant, young, child, sex and gender uh, uh, differences in, um, in diagnoses and geriatric mental health. And these are the two volumes that uh, were published then uh, leading up to the DSM uh, uh, task force. Uh, we then obtained a grant from the uh, NIH to undertake um, uh, 13 conferences over five years to prepare for the DSM-5. Uh, to promote kind of international collaboration among members of the scientific community uh, and to stimulate empirical research to try to base the uh, research uh, uh, more on, on evidence than on just a, kind of a consensus approach. Uh, this uh, effort involved uh, really almost 400 participants uh, from around the world. Uh, we had 39 countries, 16 developing nations, 51% uh, were non-U.S. participants uh, in developing uh, these um, uh, uh, conferences. Uh, among the, the approaches, we had dimensional models of personality disorders, uh, diagnostic issues in substance use, di uh, dimensional approaches in diagnostic classification, and then we looked at some of the imaging studies to see if we could have more of a stress-induced for fear circuitry disorders, somatic presentations of mental disorders, deconstructing psychoses, where we could look at uh, psychoses across a range of disorders, um, uh, and obsessive compulsive behavioral spectrum disorders, and then final uh, with the WHO public health aspects of psychiatric uh, diagnoses. Uh, and this was the monograph that we published with uh, Shekhar Saxena uh, at the WHO, uh, Norman Sartorius, um, Benedetto Saracino, uh, that was the final uh, kind of effort uh, in developing uh, a common research base for the ICD-11 and the DSM-5 uh, to develop. And then we had the DSM-5 task force from 2006 to 2007. Uh, we first appointed the work group chairs, uh, uh, and then we had uh, the work groups appointed from 2007 to 2008 that then worked until uh, 2012, uh, and we published the uh, volume in 2013. So uh, what I'll do next, uh, I mean, this is kind of the timeline for development, starting with the kind of research agenda in 2000, official formation of the task force and work groups, 2008, six to eight, uh, and then initial drafting of the diagnostic criteria starting in 2009 to 2011. Uh, we released the DSM-5 in 2013, and we thought that ICD-11 would be uh, released in 2014, but that's now been uh, expanded until 2017. Uh, and so we'll see if, in fact, uh, uh, exactly when the ICD-11 uh, takes place, but uh, our intent has been to have um, a very close coordination, you know, in the overall structure of the ICD and the DSM, although the DSM will have a lot more detail uh, in it uh, than the ICD. 
So now I'd like to just go over uh, the DSM uh, structure, uh, basically, and show you how we've uh, dealt with uh, uh, some of the coordination between the um, ICD and the, and the DSM as well. Um, section one, if you get the big book uh, of the DSM, really has a lot of this history that I've just given you, kind of the background to the development of uh, DSM. And it tells about why we need to move from a strict categorical approach to much more of a spectrum dimensional approach in diagnosis uh, and uh, realize that there are fuzzy boundaries between diagnoses as opposed to strict boundaries uh, in the, between the diagnoses. Um, section two of the um, DSM uh, has all of the diagnostic criteria and codes, the ICD codes. Section three has some emerging measures and models, uh, some of the dimensional me measures and also some new diagnoses that are recommended for further study. And then there's an appendix and, and index. Um, so in section one, there's a brief uh, developmental uh, history, guidance on the use of the manual, a definition for mental disorders, uh, a cautionary statement about using diagnostic criteria for legal or forensic uh, issues that uh, additional concerns about competency uh, and the like are necessary for legal uh, assessments. Uh, and then there's uh, a brief uh, classification summary in section one. Section two now has the overall classification structure. And what's very different about this uh, than was in the ICD uh, and in the DSM-4 is the first chapter in the ICD and DSM-4 was always the organic mental disorders, the dementias. And this is part of the hierarchy. If you had something in the first chapter, you couldn't have something in the second chapter, which was often the substance use disorders. Again, focusing on if you were psychotic as a result of a substance, um, you, know, uh, you know, you couldn't diagnose schizophrenia, uh, which is lower in the, in the hierarchy. And so uh, that was kind of how the ICD was developed. But uh, uh, we decided uh, with the WHO to make a much more developmental uh, approach and start with neurodevelopmental disorders and then schizophrenia spectrum and these uh, was considered more of a neurodevelopmental uh, disorder. Uh, and then following, uh, you know, the bipolar and related disorders, and we split out bipolar and de uh, from depressive disorders uh, instead of just having a common mood disorder uh, chapter. Um, and this is because um, of some of the concerns about uh, uh, both the longitudinal history of people who have uh, bipolar or schizophrenia uh, disorder. They tended to, to lump together more, more clearly genetically and uh, uh, as opposed to kind of the strict separation. And for years, schizoaffective disorder was kind of the bridge between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and was one of the most common diagnoses because people realized there wasn't just this strict uh, separation already, you know, in the, in the earlier uh, versions of the DSM and ICD. Um, what's interesting is that these first four chapters uh, are actually quite closely related. Uh, in the latest uh, genome-wide association studies, the GWAS studies, uh, it was found that there are common genes, you know, with autism spectrum disorder, uh, ADHD, which are in the neurodevelopmental, schizophrenia, bipolar, and the depressive disorders. All have kind of common genetic vulnerabilities. Uh, and we kind of lump these together to facilitate research as well as a clinical appreciation that, uh, that there can be uh, a certain vulnerability that depends on kind of environmental exposure uh, and what we are referring to as epigenetic factors that might switch on or switch off genes that actually make uh, the vulnerability uh, turn into an actual uh, disorder. Um, now we also decided to separate the anxiety disorders that were in um, that encompassed really three groups of disorders, anxiety disorders that included things like the uh, panic disorder or phobias uh, from the obsessive compulsive and related disorders, uh, which seemed to have a different neurocircuitry on uh, imaging studies, 
uh, than the uh, anxiety disorders and separated these from the trauma and stressor related disorders as well, putting that into a, a totally separate category. And dissociative disorders, these are the ones that kind of tend to, uh, to run together and were more part of the anxiety disorders in the earlier uh, versions. Uh, we also then looked at the somatic symptom and related disorders and put together the more uh, somatic disorders uh, such as the eating disorders, elimination disorders, sleep-wake disorders, sexual dysfunctions, and then gender dysphoria which had been uh, mm -hmm. gender identity disorder. Uh, we broke that out because it really wasn't a sexual disorder per se, it was a very different kind of disorder than the sexual dysfunction uh, conditions. So uh, this, would, this uh, overall uh, organizational arrangement um, is one that we negotiated carefully with the World Health Organization so that the ICD-11 is going to come out with virtually the same organizational arrangement. The one difference will probably be that they're going to break out a separate chapter of sleep-wake disorders that will not necessarily be in the uh, mental disorder section. And they're also going to break out the uh, sexual dysfunctions uh, that will be in another separate chapter, not mental disorders and not necessarily, uh, you know, OBGYN or urology disorders. Uh, and the gender dysphoria, they're, they're trying to figure out exactly where they're going to put um, the gender identity disorder uh, issues. Uh, but um, uh, this will basically be the same uh, organizational structure in the ICD. Now, those other, dis the earlier disorders, uh, starting with the depressive, are often referred to as internalizing disorders because they focus more on internal mood and anxiety states. In contrast, this next group uh, are often referred to as the externalizing, this disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders and the substance related and addictive disorders. Uh, so those um, uh, certainly uh, disorders tend to be comorbid uh, with each other and we included uh, in the uh, disruptive uh, and impulse control and conduct disorders area the antisocial personality disorder uh, category as well as kind of co-located uh, both in, in this section as well as in the personality disorder section. Uh, and likewise in the schizophrenia section we put schizotypal personality disorder in there which is where it is uh, with the ICD uh, as well. So it's uh, we're again looking at kind of the spectrum uh, of uh, disorders. We had talked about possibly even distributing all the personality disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder into that chapter as opposed to having a completely separate personality disorders chapter. But uh, tradition is difficult to break and we decided to still keep a separate personality disorders chapter uh, and to uh, just mention at least for schizotypal and for uh, antisocial personality disorder that they would have uh, be co-located uh, in both personality disorder and in the respective chapters. Uh, the neurocognitive disorders is, was really uh, reconceptualized from being the dementias uh, to covering 10 different neurocognitive disorders so that they're not all just focusing on uh, the um, uh, neuro um, um, uh, degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease, uh, Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia. Uh, those are all there but also in the group uh, in, is included uh, the vascular dementia uh, as well as the post-traumatic uh, say uh, traumatic brain uh, injury uh, and you have the infectious diseases like prion diseases um, and um, uh, HIV AIDS uh, which can produce a neurocognitive disorder and some of the Parkinsonian and Huntington's uh, uh, related uh, uh, neurocognitive disorders were major changes as well. Uh, so, and, and then also the substance use uh, related disorders like Korsakoff's uh, would be uh, identified in this section as well. Um, the, para the um, 
uh, personality disorders was an area where we had thought initially we would have a very dimensional uh, trait-based approach to all personality disorders. Uh, we proposed that and uh, um, it was uh, rejected by the American Psychiatric Association Board of Trustees as being too novel. Uh, they didn't think there was uh, ready for all of uh, the clinical psychiatrists to start using that, so they chose to keep that in uh, exactly the same as DSM-4 uh, in the Section 2, but to have this new proposal in a Section 3 for uh, further study. Um, and then uh, the paraphilic disorders, um, you know, had uh, some uh, changes. The major thing was that for disorders that did not have a victim, um, like uh, fetishes or trans, uh, transvestism, where people decide uh, to cross-dress and to, to the other gender, if there's no victim and people get uh, and somewhat some uh, enjoyment from these uh, particular fetishes, they said it's not a disorder if it doesn't cause distress or impairment. But if there is actually a victim, like with pedophilic disorder and the like, it's then caused, called a, a disorder. Uh, and those, of course, are uh, major disorders for forensic uh, psychiatry uh, around the world. Um, and then we also focus on some of the medication-induced movement disorders and other adverse effects of medication. We even have a uh, antidepressant withdrawal syndrome in there, uh, not just the, uh, the previous disorders uh, uh, such as um, uh, the, uh, the major neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, kind of diagnoses that can be associated with uh, antipsychotic medications. Okay, so uh, in making these changes, what happened is we actually reduced the number of disorders, separate disorders in DSM-4, were about 172, and we reduced it by about 15 disorders to about 157 disorders. Uh, and this involved, though, the addition of 15 new disorders, um, and we'll go over some of these in a bit. Uh, some of the new ones included like hoarding disorder, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder that was in the appendix before, uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, um, binge eating disorder, uh, and then a number of sleep disorders, uh, caffeine and cannabis withdrawal disorders, uh, and we also added a mild neurocognitive disorder uh, that was, is going to be important for early identification of Alzheimer's and other uh, forms of neurocognitive disorders. But what uh, the major change was is we took 50 disorders and reduced them, uh, knocked out 28, reduced them to 22 disorders. Um, and so the way we did this is we combined, for example, autism spectrum disorder was previously uh, autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, Rett syndrome, and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. These were all combined into a single disorder that would be assessed on the basis of two domains, uh, social uh, communication, uh, one domain, and the second domain being restricted repetitive uh, behaviors and interests. And so one would assess the level of severity and clinical focus on the basis of impairments in those two domains rather than saying they're separate disorders. Uh, and uh, this also uh, com comports well with the research evidence that shows these are not separate disorders. So that spectrum approach uh, is important. It doesn't mean that if you have, if you're very high on social communication and low on restricted repetitive uh, movement uh, or behavior that, that you're the, that your treatment will be exactly the same. But your treatment should be based on the deficits you have in those areas, not on the basis of a given diagnosis. And that's the approach uh, that is also being uh, taken with um, things like specific learning disorders, uh, where you combine reading, math, and disorders of written expression, um, and um, uh, 
there's a number of other somatic symptom disorders where there are previously somatization disorder, undifferentiated somatoform disorder, and pain disorders are all combined. Uh, but the, and some of the sleep disorders are also combined. But the ones that had the greatest number of combinations are the, from 12 to 22 here, are all substance uh, disorder uh, conditions. So that for all of the substance disorders, where there was previously an abuse diagnosis and a dependence diagnosis, those are merged into a single spectrum. So that uh, there were four criteria for abuse and you needed one out of four to meet criteria for abuse. And there are, uh, were seven uh, criteria for dependence and you needed three out of seven in order to meet uh, the dependence criteria uh, before. Now there are 11 criteria uh, and you need two out of 11 to be mild, two to three, uh, four to five to be uh, moderate, and six or greater to be uh, severe. So those are, uh, that, that's really some of the major uh, differences in um, the diagnoses. We also uh, removed the NOS category, not otherwise specified, in order to, uh, to to focus on other specified and unspecified, which is what the ICD has. They don't have NOS. They have either it's other specified that's not fully identified yet as a full disorder or unspecified. Uh, if somebody comes in to an emergency room and they are psychotic, uh, you might not know if it's because of drugs or because of schizophrenia or my, bipolar, and you'll just say unspecified psychosis. Uh, so. That's the WHO approach, and so by splitting these, we actually increase the number of, of uh, unspecified or uh, other specified uh, somewhat uh, as well. So let me um, just pause here uh, for a little bit, and uh, uh, w what the next section is going to be is to, I I'm going to go through rather quickly some of the uh, highlights of, of changes in the individual disorder areas. But uh, I, I'll stop for a second here and see if there are any questions about this background and, and overall change in orientation that uh, I've been able to, uh, to go over with you uh, at this point. Thank you very much. The comment is this, that uh, we think that it's very helpful to see the diagnoses more as a, um, as a uh, kind of a central tendency, if you will, <coughs> for uh, an individual to have a predominant uh, number of symptoms that fit within a given diagnostic category. But this, the, the thinking is that there is not this strict separation. As you said, people often move over time uh, in terms of uh, their diagnosis, in terms of the expression of symptoms. And the way we think about this now is that there may be, you know, a hundred genes or more that are responsible for vulnerability of schizophrenia. Uh, some of those will be shared with bipolar, with autism, with depression and the like. There are going to be another, uh, say, 100 genes that will also be uh, associated with anxiety disorders or, and depression and so forth. And we know that there are common um, um, 
genetic uh, family histories for individuals with uh, generalized anxiety disorder and major depression. Uh, what is it that causes, you know, one child in a family that has major depression and, you know, to develop, you know, generalized anxiety disorder? You know, it, there probably are certain environmental exposures, um, you know, other uh, issues, uh, both, you know, biological environment as well as uh, psychosocial environment that will cause somebody to uh, express a given disorder over, over time. So this is the, it's a very different concept, uh, you know, to having an infectious disease or say something like Louis' disease, uh, syphilis, where it, you can have, you know, uh, one diagnosis with one etiology can account for a whole range of symptoms. You know, it's a, it's a very different approach if you have, you know, 100 or 200 or 300 uh, genes that in various combinations can cause you to uh, develop a certain set of syndrome or set of syndromes that may move over time. So I think that this is the, the different approach that we're going to have to uh, uh, be conceptualizing because uh, you know, our genetics just, our genotypes don't fit our phenotypes, you know, anymore. Right. And, and so it's a, it's a major challenge for us to rethink how can we have a diagnostic system that gives adequate recognition to the, um, to the um, uh, diversity of, of expressions uh, that we're having, you know, in, with common genetic, um, you know, histories. The genes are there all the time. You mentioned affective disorders and schizophrenia, and we saw it by the schizophrenia. Needless to mention, the prodrome and schizophrenia, mm -hmm. anxiety symptoms, depressive symptoms, obsessive symptoms, and after five years, frank schizophrenia. Right. This is the potential of the country, or the military, you can you name it. But this is my, how I look at it. Well, and I, that's how we're beginning to look at it, uh, you know, in the, in the classification system as well. Yes. Okay. You. Any other? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Just like a general question regarding DSM-5. Mm -hmm. Since the early procedure of having the DSM-5. Let's hold both uh, of them. Okay. <laughs> no, hold both of them. Both? Yeah. Thank you very much for <laughs> <laughs> uh, this very intense and uh, very beneficial. Uh, I have a question generally about DSM-5. Being a psychiatrist uh, living and working away from states, since the early procedure of having DSM-5, uh, we started to, to, to see uh, very high criticism from many people against DSM-5. Yes. And being one of the people who are having the task force and head, etc. Why? And this is a question, it was for me a little bit shocking about why this very يعني, high criticism since the beginning and it is very strong and high voice and it sometimes reached to attacking the people even with some personalization uh, to that to the process. Uh, this is one issue. Uh, I don't know. It, it was for me a little bit strange. The the other thing uh, regarding the general impression about DSM-5 by the some people who are criticized that it is making more normal people abnormal. So it is more towards denormalizing the people, especially children uh, population. So what is your comment about this? Well, uh, since I uh, was deeply involved with the DSM-5 from the beginning, um, what was uh, uh, interesting, and, and actually I've been involved with the DSM since the DSM-3. Uh, I was at the NIMH and, and uh, basically provided the resources for the DSM-3 field trials. Uh, was a part of the DSM-4 task force uh, and um, uh, was then, as a result of that history, was asked to come to the APA to direct the DSM-5 process. Um, what uh, is curious about 
um, our field is that there are, in the same way that there were kind of schools of psychiatry uh, nationally, there are very strong opinions about diagnosis within um, you know, every country. Uh, <clears throat> our approach was to actually pull together a group of experts from around the world. We had something like um, 160 members of our work groups, uh, of which about 30% were international. Uh, and it was a multidisciplinary group. <clears throat> and um, uh, it was, um, however, not, did not include the leadership from the previous uh, DSM-4, uh, Alan Francis being the previous chair of the DSM-4. Um, and so there was a, um, um, as a result of that, um, we knew that there would be questions about some of the changes, uh, particularly with the group that had established the previous uh, version. But we wanted to make sure that we were open to uh, really all the new data from over 20 years. So um, we decided that we would have our presentations um, you know, internally, and then we would put it on the website. <clears throat> so in 2010, we put all of our proposed diagnostic criteria on the website and asked for comments, and we had something like over 8,000 signed comments where people sent them in and said, we think you ought to do this or that. Uh, we gave those to the 160 members of the work groups. They revised, they came back in 2011. We put another setup on the, on the website. We got something like three or 4,000 comments. <clears throat> and there was lots of media attention in, during this as well. And then for the, the third time in 2012, we put another setup, which was a kind of a penultimate uh, set. And there were certain areas <clears throat> such as the prodrome of schizophrenia. Would we put that as a new diagnosis? And there was fear if we did that, that people would start medicating uh, children who had the first earliest sign of schizophrenia and that they would may not convert to uh, schizophrenia. And there was concern about the bereavement exclusion, that for major depression, uh, if you had lost a loved one, um, you couldn't be diagnosed as major depression for at least two months, <clears throat> unless you had uh, you know, very, very severe forms of it, and <clears throat> you couldn't be started on treatment. Whereas bereavement usually will last a year or more, not two months. Uh, and there was concern that there is a very clear distinction between the symptoms of bereavement uh, as opposed to <clears throat> a major depression. And so we said rather than have exclude everybody that happens to have lost a loved one and then develops depression, we will define what the differences are between bereavement and depression in a footnote. Um, <clears throat> well, this, this caused lots of concern that now we're going to treat bereavement as a, um, as a disorder. Um, and there were other concerns about uh, ADHD, were we going to change the criteria there? Uh, there was concern about the substance abuse area. Would we, by removing abuse and uh, having it all in a spectrum, would we be uh, treating people uh, who had, you know, problems with alcohol, you know, uh, but didn't really have a disorder? Uh, and so all of these were concerns that, that we took seriously, and we asked for the criticism, and we got far more than we expected. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, that was part of our uh, approach. And uh, you'll notice that since the publication of DSM-5, you know, the controversy has suddenly died down, you know. And so, um, uh, I mean, there was going to be a campaign to, uh, uh, you know, boycott DSM-5 and so forth that hasn't exactly taken off. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a controversial field. Uh, it's almost, it's a social phenomena. I mean, um, the media loves to get involved with how do you define mental illness. And um, I think it's, um, uh, it's part of our responsibility as professionals to uh, make sure that uh, we follow the evidence as closely as we can. We recognize the limitations of the research base for our field. And uh, we're as uh, honest and transparent with it as we can uh, be. And, and that's, you know, we think that there is a lot of clinical judgment required for making a 
distinction, a threshold between normal and psychopathology uh, still <clears throat> because we don't have clear biological markers. Uh, but nonetheless, that is the state of the field uh, in many areas of medicine. Uh, we don't have biological markers for migraine headaches, uh, for um, you know, uh, a lot of conditions. Uh, we don't have cures for many uh, you know, uh, conditions. And the more we learn about mental disorders um, as chronic diseases, uh, the more we look at the similarities between, say, diabetes and depression, we don't have cures for diabetes either. Uh, you know, we have, we manage it. We, we know that it's a spectrum condition that depends on genetics and environmental exposure in much the way, uh, same way as our, me our mental disorders. So it's, it's an important uh, lesson. Um, you know, we, we certainly have to be um, uh, open to criticism, you know, of the field and be responsive to it, uh, but uh, not be overwhelmed by it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Well, let's. Uh, you'll need to let me know if you th you think we should have a break at all with it yes. with people, or if you want to. We're supposed to have a break after fifteen minutes, so let's make it after thirty. Go another fifteen minutes or so. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Let's start with neurodevelopmental disorders and what some of the changes were here. Um, as I already mentioned to you, the autism sp uh, sp spectrum disorder um, was a, uh, a major change where we combined uh, autistic disorder, Asperger's, pervasive developmental disorder, uh, Rett syndrome, which is genetic syndrome, um, was um, kind of separated out and, and uh, childhood disintegrative disorder were all put on in this spectrum. Uh, also intellectual disability, which was previously referred to as mental retardation, um, was uh, changed fairly um, substantially in terms of um, uh, focusing on not just IQ, which is how it was uh, intellectual uh, ability was, was uh, emphasized in uh, ICD and the DSM, but you have to have uh, adaptive functioning as a key component of intellectual disability and the criteria uh, of your ability to exercise uh, judgment uh, and adaptive functioning is critical for understanding the levels of severity of uh, intellectual disability. Um, so. Uh, and this, the term disability is also uh, one that the ICD does not want to have <clears throat> in any of their disorders in ICD because they have uh, disability is assessed in the International Classification of Functioning, the ICF, which is a separate classification in the WHO uh, from the ICD, which is disorders. So the fact, we, we however, in the U.S. and, and internationally, uh, the term intellectual disability has replaced mental retardation, and there are journals of intellectual disability and so forth, uh, and so we decided to use that term, but we put in parentheses, which was the preferred term of the uh, WHO, which is intellectual developmental disorder, and they have modified that somewhat again. They're still trying to decide what the final name will be uh, for this condition in the, in the uh, ICD-11. ADHD criteria changed somewhat. <clears throat> uh, in previously, the age of onset had to be by age seven. But uh, we now said it, it, we raised it to the age of onset can be up to age 12 because sometimes children who have very good intellectual capabilities can, uh, can uh, compensate for an, a, for an attentional problem uh, by, uh, you know, various mechanisms until they're 12 years old when it becomes more difficult. The other thing is that we recognized after having followed children with ADHD into adulthood uh, that there, many of them could not even recall when the first symptoms were 
uh, if you require them to have occurred before age seven. They could recall back to age 12 much more likely than going all the way back to a, kind of a preschool age. So that was an important com consideration. And for adults, we also found <clears throat> that if you follow these children over time, instead of six out of nine criteria um, in attention or in hyperactivity and impulsivity in those two domains, uh, that five out of nine would be a good threshold for adults because there was greater frontal lobe development and they could suppress some of the hyperactivity or other attentional problems by, as adults. So um, we changed that. And th this was when we said we were going to tr change the criteria uh, from six to five for adults. I mean, there was, you know, a huge criticism uh, about, uh, you know, we're trying to medicalize normality again. You know, so, so that's the, the kind of thing that you, and, but we could, we could actually point to an enormous, you know, research base, you know, a longitudinal follow-up to say this is appropriate. Uh, and that it is appropriate to use stimulants in adults uh, if they continue to have, uh, you know, attention deficit disorder as well. So that, that's the type of thing that we uh, continually dealt with. Schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, and um, did you receive copies of, um, of some of the chapters? Um, I don't know, we, we had talked with AstraZeneca that had requested uh, copies of some of the, uh, the chapters and four chapters in schizophrenia, I think bipolar, uh, cognitive, neurocognitive disorders, and uh, PTSD. Uh, I take it they didn't make them available to you? Okay, they, hey, <laughs> what have you. I thought this was rather unusual that, that if you get the book, you just read the book, you know, uh, and you don't need to have, uh, you know, Xerox copies of, <laughs> of pages. But in any case, um, we, will, we did set aside some time in the afternoon to have uh, extended discussions on schizophrenia, depressive trauma, and neurocognitive disorders. You'll see at the end of your agenda. Um, but uh, to give you a, just a quick overview right now with uh, schizophrenia, um, major changes. We eliminated the special treatment of uh, uh, bizarre delusions and special hallucinations in criterion A. Uh, in DSM-4, if you had these what are called Schneiderian criteria of voices are talking to each other and the like, on the basis of a single criteria, you could make a diagnosis of schizophrenia. We said, nah, there, we can't really distinguish between bizarre delusions and other delusions and hallucinations that well. Uh, and we're going to require at least two symptoms to meet criterion A. Uh, you must have... Uh, uh, one of the symptoms has to be delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. Uh, and there was also the motor symptoms like catatonia and the negative symptoms, uh, apathy and the like. Uh, and previously, you could just have catatonia and apathy and, and you could have met criteria. We said, no, you can't do that anymore. You have to have at least one of the symptoms has to be delusions, hallucinations, or dis disorganized speech. And then you can have kind of catatonia or, or um, uh, the negative symptoms to meet criteria for, di for diagnosis. Also, catatonia is now uh, identified as a spe separate specifier. Catatonia actually occurs much more commonly in mood disorders than it does in schizophrenia. Uh, and it can occur in uh, many other disorders. It can occur in autism. Uh, it can occur... Uh, you know, in some of the anxiety disorders, um, obsessive compulsive disorders. But the key issue here is that you don't really treat it with antipsychotics. From a clinical standpoint, um, you, it's important if you recognize catatonia in the emergency room that you're using something like benzodiazepines or ECT and not antipsychotics to treat it. And it can be a life-threatening condition. So we wanted to make clear that catatonic schizophrenia is not, you know, all of catatonia. Uh, and so um, uh, this was the result of a really international concern about, uh, you know, some of the subtypes of um, schizophrenia, which um, really also do not stay uh, valid over time. So. Uh, separating paranoid schizophrenia, catatonic schizophrenia, undifferentiated schizophrenia, those subtypes are gone in the DSM-5. Pardon? Uh, because they're not stable. 
people move from one to another. They're not permanent. They're, they're a form of presentation, but they're not stable. Pardon? We use it, you can use it as a specifier. Okay, and that's, uh, and there are a few other situations where, uh, like with um, ADHD, uh, we also uh, don't have separate categories of attention only or hyperactivity only. We can say if the major presentation is hyperactivity or attentional deficits, you can use that as a specifier in, in presentation, but they move over time as well. They're not rigidly predictive of clinical course. Um, <clears throat> for bipolar disorder, we've included uh, increased energy activity as a criterion A symptom um, for hypomania or mania, and we've removed the mixed episode from DSM-4 and replaced it with a mixed feature specifier for manic, hypomanic, and major depressive episodes. Um, this is because in order to have mixed episode, you had to meet full criteria for bipolar and full criteria for major depression at the same time. And that, that was a pretty rare phenomenon. And uh, what was much more important is that if you have some of the uh, manic, hypomanic symptoms, uh, you know, and you're depressed, that's a very good predictor over time that you may be at, at risk for developing bipolar disorder. And so that, that was one of the reasons for wanting to have even the sub-threshold manic symptoms um, being present in depression are important. <clears throat> we also added an anxious distress uh, specifier for bipolar, but that was in many ways more uh, important for the uh, major depressive uh, disorder. Now, <clears throat> uh, okay, so, a major new one, and this, this got a lot of attention in the press, was the addition of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Uh, the first, um, uh, and this was because a lot of children in the U.S. were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder and being placed on uh, antipsychotic medication uh, for treatment of this uh, when they didn't have the episodic irritability or rage reactions um, that can often be a part of pediatric bipolar disorder, they had a persistent, continuous irritability that over time tended to evolve into either a depressive or an anxiety disorder, but there was no family history of bipolar disorder and there was no transition into adult bipolar disorder, and it was really questionable as to whether or not calling them pediatric bipolar disorder and treating them with antipsychotics was in their interest or uh, the like. So we <clears throat> developed the criteria for this disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And the, the first uh, iteration of that name was really kind of a tempered dysregulation disorder. And so we were, we were told that we're going to normalize temper or, or medicalize temper tantrums in kids. And so we decided, well, we don't want to leave that impression, so we'll change the name to DMDD. But we still got criticism that uh, somehow uh, we're lowering the threshold uh, for um, uh, diagnosis um, um, with this. This is actually, you have to have these criteria for a full year. So th this isn't trivial. If, some, if a kid has the uh, DMDD uh, and you can separate it clearly from uh, bipolar disorder, we think that, that this will help us get a better understanding of this uh, kind of chronic uh, form of uh, uh, mood dysregulation. <clears throat> uh, persistent depressive disorder replaced dysthymia uh, so that uh, if you have chronic major depression or if you have dysthymia, the duration is the more critical criteria, not the exact number of symptoms. Um, and um, that's a it was shown that when people have over two years of continuous uh, symptoms, whether they're the previous dysthymia criteria or the major depressive criteria, they have the same correlates uh, and the same gen genetic uh, background and the like. So this is a, this is a major um, uh, change. We wanted to eliminate the idea of double depression. You know, we think that they've got one depression uh, and it's a chronic one. Uh, and so that was, 
that was the uh, part of the motivation for getting rid of, uh, uh, you know, a separate kind of dysthymia from major depression. Interesting footnote, I don't know if you use, uh, know the PHQ-9, uh, which is the screening instrument for major depression, uh, but uh, hopelessness was a term that was in the dysthymia and not in major depression, but in the PHQ-9, uh, which is a screener, the second criteria, uh, hopeless was put in to the major depression screening criteria, even though it wasn't even in the diagnostic criteria. For Bob Spitzer, by Bob Spitzer, who actually helped develop the, you know, both uh, the DSM-3 and 3R and, and the PHQ-9 screener. So, um, there, there's been an attempt to kind of merge these for some time, and we finally did it. Um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder was in the uh, appendix of uh, DSM-4, uh, and it is now much better described and is a, a full uh, disorder. Um, and we also have them with mixed features and with anxious distress in, in major depression. Now, one of the real debates was whether or not we would have a diagnosis of mixed anxiety depression because the primary care physicians love it. Uh, most people who come in uh, to primary care settings or even into uh, especially psychiatric settings will not come in with just major depressive symptoms, you know, in the criteria. They will usually have uh, anxiety symptoms. And in fact, if they have substantial anxiety, they have a, you know, poor treatment response, a poor clinical course, and are much more at risk for uh, suicide. And uh, so we debated whether or not we should, should have, you know, a separate anxious depression as a separate category and decided rather than that, we would basically have a specifier of anxious distress which someone can actually rate the level of anxious distress and follow it over time so it becomes a clear focus of clinical care. So that's the, um, uh, you know, a significant change, you know, in the uh, DSM-5. Um, anxiety disorders, as I, I mentioned, was relocated to its own chapter um, with panic attacks as a specifier for any mental disorder. Uh, panic disorder and agoraphobia are unlinked. Uh, before you couldn't have a separate agoraphobia independent of panic disorder. And the thinking of um, uh, Don Klein from Columbia University who actually forced the merger of these back with DSM-3, uh, the thinking was that nobody would ever develop agoraphobia unless it was a fear of panic attacks. Uh, and in fact, what is clear is some people will never go out of their house or uh, have uh, uh, the same symptoms of agoraphobia and never have developed panic attacks. And we could show this from epidemiologic studies, even though oftentimes in clinical samples, more severe samples, they would come in with panic attacks. And that's the, the, the interesting thing about the history of classification since DSM-3 is that we had both community populations with less severe forms of the disorder, as well as the clinical populations, which were the populations uh, in often inpatient settings that were the, the populations that were used to develop the finer criteria, the RDC criteria, and the DSM-3 criteria. So until we did the ECA study and we showed that um, people don't segregate in, in quite the same way in community and primary care populations as they do in inpatient populations, we didn't have an appreciation of the need for better threshold measures between normality and psychopathology, where there's much more of a spectrum in the community and in, clin in outpatient clinical populations than there is in inpatient uh, populations. So this, is, uh, this was a very good example of how epidemiological data informed a separation of panic disorder from agoraphobia. And for the first time, they're actually separate disorders. <clears throat> we also then, eliminated the disorders that, uh, the whole section uh, of disorders that begin in childhood, and we integrated the, quote, childhood disorders into the respective conditions so that we have um, <coughs> separation anxiety disorder, uh, 
and selective mutism in the chapter on anxiety disorders instead of in a separate chapter of uh, disorders that begin in childhood. Uh, and we tried in various chapters uh, to, ha if there was the earliest uh, presentation of a disorder was in childhood, we would put that disorder first in the chapter on, uh, in this case, anxiety disorders. Uh, DMDD, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, is the first uh, in the chapter on mood disorders. And likewise, in, um, <clears throat> you'll see in the, in the stress and trauma disorders, the first uh, diagnosis is reactive attachment disorder, <clears throat> which is kind of the prototype of, uh, of a stress reaction in early childhood. So uh, that's another organizational issue. Uh, but we also find that separation anxiety can actually occur in adults as well. Okay, 10 minutes? Okay. <coughs> so uh, those are some of the um, uh, findings. That the last one I'll mention is that in the eating disorders area, pica, which is often you know, eating of non-organic uh, material like dirt or you know, paste or something like that, that this, um, this occurs as kind of one of the first diagnoses in the eating disorders uh, chapter as well. <coughs> okay. Um, now, obsessive compulsive disorder was broken out from uh, the anxiety disorders as a separate chapter. Um, and they, we linked into this <coughs> several disorders that had been in uh, other chapters. So that, um, uh, for example, a new disorder is hoarding disorder uh, that was previously considered a part of obsessive compulsive disorder, but it does not have any of the obsessional th thoughts or the uh, compulsive hand washing behavior and the like that's a part of, uh, of OCD. So, but it's in the spectrum <laughs> and uh, it really requires very different treatment. And for uh, those of you involved in public health issues uh, in uh, given cities or states, you'll know that these, these people really uh, pose a, a health risk if their house becomes so cluttered that it becomes a fire hazard or a health hazard if they collect uh, cats or dogs or animals and, and the like and cannot uh, get them out of the house. So uh, this is a, um, a new disorder that has a very good evidence base. Uh, skin picking or excoriation disorder uh, is a part of this, trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder is also a part of the spectrum. Uh, and body dysmorphic disorder uh, was put into, out of the somatic disorders and put into this because it also has much the same uh, focus, obsessional, um, you know, behavior as uh, uh, in, in this spectrum. Um, and it's possible to have also various levels of, uh, <clears throat> of insight, good, fair, poor, or absent delusional insight. So one can have virtually a psychotic uh, belief that their nose is too long or something like that, or it's too big, or it's ugly, or some spot is something that has to be removed. Uh, and this is the body dysmorphic uh, uh, disorder where there's no insight saying that, uh, that the, the individual um, you know, uh, is uh, over, uh, you know, uh, uh, diagnosing or over, uh, uh, you know, uh, exaggerating the uh, severity of a perceived uh, physical uh, uh, defect. And um, the key issue here is that psychoses can occur in different diagnoses. They're not just in the delusional, the psychotic spectrum. And the treatment for this generally is not antipsychotics, but it is actually uh, antidepressant uh, medication as opposed, and that will be, have a much greater uh, possibility, uh, whether it's an afrenil or some other uh, form of antidepressant uh, treatment for this that is similar to the OCD kind of treatments. So these are some of the uh, differences that we were trying to uh, reflect uh, in the uh, chapter structure as well. Um, the feeding and eating disorders, as I mentioned, a binge eating disorder was elevated to the main body, the manual from the, uh, from the appendix. Uh, this does not have, um, uh, as opposed to bulimia, it has the same eating uh, 
kind of overeating uh, behavioral symptoms, but it does not have the purging uh, kind of, uh, uh, or vomiting kind of um, um, symptoms that are part of uh, bulimia. We also include pica and rumination disorder in this chapter rather than in the chapter for child adolescent disorders. Anorexia ner nervosa, we eliminated uh, amenorrhea as a requirement for uh, anorexia since uh, many people could actually be uh, expressing all of the other symptoms of anorexia without amenorrhea. And of course, there are males who also have anorexia for which uh, that symptom didn't apply. Um, the feeding disorder of infancy or early childhood has been renamed avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Uh, and this was um, changed because first of all, there were very few feeding disorders of infancy uh, ever diagnosed. And uh, secondly, uh, there was a, a number of people, about 14% in eating disorder clinics of people who had come in with severe forms of eating disorder, like they wouldn't eat anything except white food or they couldn't eat any kind of uh, uh, textured uh, food. Uh, and uh, they would go to the point of um, um, really being uh, severely ill. And from a nutritional standpoint, they would have to be put on IVs and other things, but there was no classification for them. Uh, and so this avoidant uh, restricted food intake disorder really is a heterogeneous group, but it covers a range from childhood to uh, usually early adulthood uh, in which people have this particular uh, form of eating disorder. I think with that one I'm going to take a break and we'll go into uh, the next uh, group of uh, disorders a bit uh, after your break. <laughs>